my idea is that um, big data is going to transform scientific discovery. You may have heard about big data and you may have wondered exactly what that means. So let's start with an example, and this is not in a scientific context, it's more in an ordinary context. Imagine you come across a postcard, an older postcard, it has this image on it, an old photo, with no attribution information at all. You have no idea where this was taken, but you'd like to find out. What strategy could you adopt to find that out? Well, you could carry the postcard with you every day, and you could show it to all your friends, and you could ask if they know where it was taken. That might or might not work. Um, or you could use the internet. Uh, there's a new, actually there's a new service, I think it's a little known, a Google service called um, Search by Image, and it lets you take an image that Google's never seen before and upload it to the website. And I did that just a couple days ago with this image, which I happened to have taken on vacation. I uploaded it to Google, and Google thought about it for about a third of a second, and it produced an amazing amount of information. It told me what city that was, it was taken in, Istanbul, what structure it was taken in, and, and what room within the structure it was taken in. Then it provided me with six or eight images that were visually similar, many of which were taken in the same room, and one of which is almost identical to the image that I uploaded. It was taken by a different tourist on a different day with a different camera, uh, and it was posted in a Brazilian website. So this is pretty amazing. It, it looks like something of a, of a miracle, and, but behind the scenes there's a lot of infrastructure and capabilities that make this possible. For one, Google owns a global network of massive data centers. This is their data center outside of Atlanta stuffed full of high-performance computers and storage and high-performance networking. And then there's a small army of experts, applied mathematicians and computer programmers, computational scientists, experts in computer vision. And all this together forms a kind of environment for discovery. And that's what we mean by big data. The data itself is at the center of that environment. And the fact that it's big may not even be the most challenging thing about it. Sometimes it's challenging because it's complex or it's heterogeneous or it's very noisy, but that data sits at the center and all these other capabilities I talked about um, are combined into a larger discovery environment that lets us answer questions we couldn't answer before. Now this is what Google is doing, it's what Facebook and Netflix and Amazon are all doing, and increasingly it is what scientists are doing. And in fact, many scientific fields have been transformed or in the process of being transformed by this big data paradigm, and climate modeling is a good example. Another, um, there are a number of examples in high energy physics as well, and in fact, the, the amazing announcement last summer about discovery for evidence of the Higgs boson that you may have heard about, and Berkeley Lab played a big role in that, um, was, the res was a triumph of big data analysis. And one way to visualize the impact of big data on the sciences is actually to look at computer networks where all the data, all the data has to cross the networks to get from one location to another. And you might be surprised to learn that Berkeley Lab manages a very large scale computer network. It's the fastest science network in the world. It interconnects all the national labs at national scale. And if you look at the history of data on that network, which is called the Energy Sciences Network or ESNet, it's really skyrocketing. And that's the impact of big data science. And just a tiny digression on networking, because I manage the Energy Sciences Network, I want to say that these big data flows we describe as elephants, because they are a million times or maybe 10 million times larger than the more ordinary flows that you and I generate when we check our email, or we browse the web, or we use YouTube. We refer to those as mice. And it turns out the mice and the elephants in this realm as in the natural realm, uh, at least mythically, they don't inter interact very well in the computer networking realm. And in particular, the mice are, are disturb the elephants. The elephants are very sensitive. So we have to build sort of fast lanes for the elephants in our network that can accommodate the big data flows and make sure they can flow at maximum speed. Okay, so where is all this data coming from? A lot of it is coming from massive scientific instruments. This is a picture of the Atlas detector at CERN, and it's one of the two instruments responsible for, the for collecting evidence that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson. And it is one of the largest and most complex and expensive scientific instruments ever built, and it, it, it produces a lot of big data. Here's another instrument. This one's just on the drawing boards. It hasn't even been built yet. It's a distributed radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array, and it will be built in Australia and in Southern Africa. And it has hundreds and hundreds of dishes and sensor arrays, and the data that's coming from those parts together adds up to much more data than can be carried today by the gl entire global internet. In fact, 100 times more. So some of these big instruments are truly producing just massive amounts of data, but 
in addition to that, smaller instruments are beginning to produce a lot of data. So small environmental or weather sensors or, or desktop DNA sequencers or medical imaging devices or little individual t detectors that are part of larger facilities, they're all producing a lot of data. Um, and that, that is truly transforming scientific discovery. So back to this picture. Um, you may wonder, how do scientists interact productively with all this data? Is there a tool like Google that enables them to short circuit a lot of painful manual uh, analysis and generate sort of leaps of insight quickly? And the answer is that yes, those tools are being developed. Some of them are being developed at Berkeley Lab or with close participation at Berkeley Lab. And I'll tell you about just a couple of them briefly. Um, both of the ones I'm going to tell you about, you can Google and learn about, and I think you can access them online and get your own accounts and interact with them, actually. So they're, they're, they're to some extent, public tools. This one is called the Materials Project. It's a tool for materials sciences, scientists, and it lets them, um, materials scientists can use this tool to find new compounds and better compounds for building uh, new batteries or solar cells or many, many other devices. And they don't need to do that experimentally. They don't need to do it by building or synthesizing the compounds in the lab. They can do it computationally. And this has a couple of advantages. Can, it can speed up their work a lot. And it also holds the promise of being, being able to let them do things they would never imagine doing in the lab. Here's another example. Um, this is called the, the knowledge base or K-base for predictive biology. This is quite an interesting tool because it brings together over 900 separate data sets um, into a very rich environment that scientists can use for interacting with the data. This is only one tool, the sort of pathways tool of a, a couple of dozen that K-base provides. And this tool lets scientists um, pose questions about and explore the, the structure and function of proteins and genes. Okay, I want to close with, with one final idea, which is that Berkeley Lab is really a world pioneer in harnessing big data for science. And that's, I think, because we have most of the ingredients required to create that environment for discovery. So we've got lots of instruments, big and small, that produce a lot of data. We've got one of the world's um, foremost computational centers, NERSC Supercomputing Center, currently at Oakland, moving soon back uphill to Berkeley. And the importance of NERSC is not just that it's got, um, you know, a top five supercomputer, but it's got lots of experts and staff, expert in making that computer useful in a scientific context. We've got an amazing array of applied mathematicians, computational scientists, programmers. Um, we've got the world's fastest science network, and then remarkable domain scientists, physicists, biologists, chemists, like the people I'm sharing the stage with. And together, this creates um, a really productive environment for discovery around big data. So in closing, the big idea is big data will transform science, and it's happening at Berkeley Lab today. Thank you.